Okay, so hello everyone. It's already 5 p.m. so we're gonna start. Thank you for attending my lecture. And first, a few words about myself. I'm currently a backend engineer on Brainly, a Q&A website for students. Here you have my Twitter and email. If you have any questions afterwards and you want to be able to catch me or ask them there, you feel free just to email me and I will definitely respond. So, now the agenda. First, quick intro and few of my really free thoughts. Then I will explain you the algorithm itself. Afterwards, some efficient uh, tips if you plan to implement it. And then some questions and hopefully answers. So, first the intro and my free thoughts. I think that we as developers sometimes have to be artists and sometimes have to be engineers. And if sometimes also philosophers, like it was said on the keynote, we have to discuss. And one of the good ways to provoke this discussion, just take the two complete opposite sides, for example, Symfony and the Laravel developer, and ask which framework is better, on the, which one should I use next time. And definitely there will be a discussion, pretty long and pretty brutal, I think. So why do I think we sometimes have to be artists? Because we have to choose architecture and patterns, design patterns, libraries and frameworks. And basically these things are, have to be taken by our experience, sometimes by our gut. Usually we don't have any kind of metrics to say, well, this thing is definitely better than this. This framework is definitely better than this one. Why? Because I think so. And on the other hand, we also a lot of we also are in a big part engineers. We have to take care of performance, of scalability, of speed, and this kind can be easily measurable. We can always say, hey, this app responds 20% faster now after my improvements. So yeah. This is the part where we can clearly show what's going on and how good it is performing. And also, it goes for the choose of our algorithms and creation of our own ones. So, let's talk about them. Let's, for a few seconds, and not for a few seconds, for the rest of the presentation, let's focus on the algorithms. So, how do we measure that one algorithm is better than the other? There is quite a few scales right now, small O, big O, but the most widely used one is the big O notation. And it basically tells us how many operation does the al given algorithm have to conduct to finalize the task on N elements. So for example, if we have an algorithm with O N complexity and we give it the twice the size input, it will conduct the operation in twice the time. But if we have o, o n squared complexity, and then we give twice the size input, it will take quadruple as long. And this comes from big O cheat sheet uh, dot com website, which is pretty good and it's on the GitHub, so you can also conclude. There are a lot of algorithms, like sorting algorithms with examples there. And it is, I, f I agree a lot with that. What, what, it, uh, what does it mean that some algorithm is excellent? Basically, O1 means no matter how the big input is, it will always take the same time to process it. So now we have our foundations for the rest of the talk. I will explain you what, the, what was my problem when I started working on it. So one day, my coworker from another business department approached me and said, hey, we have this very long list, like 1,000 or 10,000 or even more questions, and we want to find a duplicates amongst them. And my first thought was, well, let's just compare first with the second and second with the third and so on and so on. And it was one of the worst idea anybody ever had because it has n square complexity. And also, the comparing of the string, it's not so fast. 
we can solve it by using hash tables. Just calculate the hash of each single string, if each single question, insert it in, into table, and if the two questions are the same, we will have a collision. So just like that, we found the duplication. But that was only the part of the problem. The bigger and hard, much harder part was that he wanted to find also not exact matches, but near duplicates. Let's look at the, these two questions. So we may think that for us, well, it basically means the same. I know that king and ruler sometimes can be totally different things, but let's assume in our domain it, it means the same. And he also wanted to catch this kind of phrases. So the question was how to even approach it. When I look at these two questions, I know they are the same, but how can my computer, my program, difference them? There are a lot of string metrics, which basically will sh tell us how different two, two strings are. But I will focus now on Jacquard index. It's not exactly a string matrix, more the metric of similarity between two sets. So we have two questions. Who was the first king of Poland and who was the first ruler of Poland? Let's now put it into two sets. Sets are unordered, so the order of words doesn't matter. And now the value of the card index is intersection of their union of these two sets. So we count how many elements, words, do they have in common. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And how many unique elements there are in total. And we can see six plus one plus one, eight. So our Jacquard index is six eighths, which is 0 0.70 high. And the first thought, the bigger the Jacquard index, the more similar the sets. So yeah, we can say uh, that above some threshold, we can consider two questions a duplicate. But what's the threshold? The best way to find it is just to take from your domain expert a list of pair of duplicates and then just iterate over them and measure the Jacquard index. And afterwards, scramble list and calculate the Jacquard between the unique ones. And after the experiments, uh, let's say we have 0 0.5 is our threshold. So everything with the Jacquard index higher than 0 0.5 will be considered as duplicate every pair, whereas every pair which uh, Jacquard, with Jacquard index below 0 0.5 will be counted as unique. But what's the problem? We have to compare, like I said, first with the second, then first with the third, and so on, and so on, and so on. And if we have just five questions, no, uh, five questions, we will have 10 operations. So what's the exact number of operations? We can quickly write a formula. It's n squared minus n divided by 2. And if we plot it, we can easily see that the number goes quadratic. And like it's stated in big O, it's bad. It's really bad because if we have just as 10 many as questions as we had earlier, our algorithm with will take about 100 times longer. So this is bad. But you know what's fast? And I also said that earlier, hash tables. But let's go back basically to what hash algorithms do. They simplifying take a string and return some number on the output. But the great part in the hash algorithm and what we are using them for, for example, for passwords, in even a single bit is different in one string from, from the other, we want to get completely different hash. For example, someone get a hold in some way on our database and then know that our passwords hashed is this, then if we almost guess the password, is just one letter wrong, we still want to give him totally different hash, so there's no possibility of him finding the real password. Yeah, I have here the example of fairly similar strings, dog and dove. It's 
just a typo can be. The letters are pretty near on the keyboard. And as we can see, the hashes are totally different. If we looked at the hashes only, we couldn't say that they were made from anything similar. And our goal is to find the algorithm that will allow us to produce the same hashes for near questions, for the similar ones. And as I'm explaining, I will use this. Oh. OK. Mm. I will use these three questions. We can consider the first, who was the first king of Poland, the first ruler, as a duplicate, whereas this first is unique to the other ones. And let's look at the Jacquard indexes. We can see that 0 0.5 is for unique, where 0 0.4 is for uh, 0 0.575 is for duplicates, where 0 0.4 is for unique, and it can it fits our threshold like I said 0 0.5 earlier. So to calculate the min hash, min hash is the algorithm I will be explaining. We have to take the dictionary. Dictionary is the list of every possible word we have in our, the, all of our documents. Then we scramble them, take a totally random order, permutate them, and put it into table, like this. Yeah, that's, it's one of the crucial and also one of the hardest part. So we take them into the table, and we iterate row by row, starting with the row with the word last, and check if this given word is in our question we're considering. We go first by row, then by column. So the word last, it's not in the question who was the first king of Poland, nor is in the second, but it's in the question who was the last pharaoh of Egypt. So we put the index of given word there, and it's one. And then we go to the second row, who, while it's in all of our questions, so you write number two in all corresponding cells. And when we have it, we can go onto the rest of the rows and fill the table to the end. And since the name minhash may be a little spoiler, we have to, for each question, take the minimal value. So. For the first and second, it will be two. And for the third, it will be one. And this is our first part of a hash, of a fingerprint for a given question. Then we have to create another random permutation and repeat the whole procedure. And we fill. We see that the word D is every, in every question. And we fill the table take the minimal value, and have the second part of the fingerprint. And after repeating these steps for n times, basically as many as we want, we will produce a fingerprint for a given question. Sorry. OK. Let's look at the six-part fingerprint. We can see that for the more similar questions are, the more similar the fingerprints are. And basically, how much similar? Well, they agree in about what was their Jacquard index. Well, was it by accident, by chance? Well, a little, because it's probability. But now the, it comes the first part of math. Let's wonder how to even calculate the Jacquard index I mentioned. We, if we consider right now two questions, have basically three types of row in our table. Either the row, the given word, is in both questions, either it is in one of them, or either it's in none of them. So when we state it this way, we can say that the Jacquard index is basically number of rows of type A, where the word is in both questions, 
divided by the number of rows B plus number of rows of types A. And when we are, so the Jacquard index is A divided by A plus B. And what's the probability that during the random shuffling we will produce this order of words that it will produce the same number at given position? So the total list of the words we are shuffling, we can say it's A plus B. Because if the word is in neither of questions, it will not influence in any way our fingerprint. So in the denominator, we have A plus B, the same as in the Jacquard index. And in nominator, we have the number of rows which are common for the both words. So again, A. So the probability that the index at given position is equal for these two questions, it's equal to Jacquard index. And that's the reason why they were the fingerprints were agreeing in so many places. And here comes another conclusion. The bigger the number of the permutations, the more probable it is that the fingerprints will completely agree. Here I have formula, but I've, I was wrong. It's my mistake. And now, where's the, we've, we saw already the min part in min hash. And now what's, where's the hard hash part? So let's wonder what permutation basically does. Permutation maps each word, like we, say, oh, like we saw, for example, here, to a number. The word D is mapped to number one. The word of is mapped to number two, and so on. But what's the problem with random permutation? It takes time to create them. It takes time to store them. And also, the f why I think biggest problem, we have to have already at the beginning whole dictionary. If any new word comes in, we won't be able to process them. We will have to recalculate all of our permutation. And this would be, well, useless. Our thing would be useless then. So what, do we, what we can do? We can take an algorithm which maps our string, our word in question, to some number. And that's the hash algorithm. Basically, anyone, any, any hash algorithm. As uh, SHA-1, uh, MD5, and so on and so on. But for every single permutation, we have to take another algorithm. Because if you would take the same, we would always get the same result, the sum random, the sum order. So it wouldn't be random. So, like I said, we have six permutations here. So, yeah, it is possible that we would find six algorithms, but in real life, I used 200 fingerprint size. So, where to get 200 hash algorithms? And here you have one, for example, and the five, so 616. Then you have second, so MD5 XOR 8163, then you have third, and so on, and so on, and so on. Basically, if you want to create another hash algorithm, we can create the output of, the, of an existing one, and they make XOR with some kind of random number. Well, I think, but uh, just it's totally a guess that the prime numbers would be explicitly good for this kind of for this purpose. Why? Because prime numbers are in better in general to use. Uh, but like I say, it's totally a guess, and with my experiments, the random numbers were totally okay. And the second way is to use, for example, more more hash, which takes a random which takes a seed as an argument on creation. And if we have two more more hashes with the different seeds, well, then basically we have two totally different hashing algorithms. So now get back to our fingerprints. We can see that they are similar. 
And, but still, if you want to compare them, we have to compare first part with the first, then the second with the second, and so on and so on and so on. So it will still take a lot of time, and we still have to still have n squared complexity. But let's put it into groups, into B groups or buckets by n, um, n numbers each. Uh, if you were be ever seeing an uh, implementation, it is also often that the n argument is named k. We are hashing the into b buckets by k elements. And as we can see, our duplicates has the same hash. Let's name it hash, because it is. They have the same hash. And we now doesn't, don't have to compare the first with the first and the second and check how many common elements they have. We just can compare single values. And it's much faster, much nicer to write, and we can use hash tables. But again, was it a accident that these two questions have the same hash here? Well, now, it's the, now it comes the second part of probability calculation. It's a little bit complex, but I also promise it's the last one. So first, we stated and proved that the probability that to, I will show you here because, that the single value at the given position for the two questions is uh, equal, is equal to Jacquard index. It's 0 0.75, like we said. So what's the probability that all our three numbers will be the same, so whole hash? It's 0 0.75 to the third power, because we have 0 0.75 times 0 0.75 times 0 0.75. It's somewhere equal to 0 0.4. Now, what's the probability that all of the fragments in our hash will be, whole our hash will be different, it's one minus it. Simple probability. Now, what's the probability that both of these groups will be different? So we square it, 0 0.34. And now the final equation, what's the probability that at, they will have at least one group in common? It's 0 0.66. So, why it's important that they will have at least one group in common? Because we can create a hash table for each column here. And then just put the items into hash table. If we have a collision, well, then we have our duplicates. And as we can see here, it works. I may just have produced the values that will work here, but it it will work with the random permutation. We just have to produce a lot of them. So how to, I group them by three, but well, can we group them by another number? Yes, we can. In this case, we can put them into two groups by three or into three groups by two. And now, is, will the probability of the occurrence of them uh, having a collision will be different. Yes, it will. And we can plot it with our final equation simplified. And basically, what we can read from this plot? We can read that the smaller groups are, and that was also my practice uh, conclusion from practice with the algorithm, the smaller the groups are, the higher the lower the Jacquard index can be, and they will be marked as duplicates. So the smaller the groups, the more false positives we will get. So the more questions which are unique will be also marked as duplicate. But the more duplicates we'll catch. And it, it's in, it depends what's important to you, and where, where you put the line, and where your domain expert put the line. And that's the more real life example. That's the plot for every possible grouping with 200 hashes, 200 
size the fingerprint. So Y200, well, honestly, it was default in library I've used, but also it has a lot of natural dividends. And the B times N must be the number of fingerprints. So the next number I would try would be 240, because it has more dividends. And also with the experiment, I saw that 0 0.2 was my threshold value. Everything with the threshold bigger than 0 0.2 can be marked as duplicate. So I've plotted my values, and I was looking for the curve, which was overlapping the best with my step function. And it was either uh, b equal to, so the groups of two elements, or it was the b equal 4, so the groups of four elements. And after the experiments, it worked better with grouped of two. It was a little bit slower, but uh, it worked better. And the more, uh, the more uh, elements you will have in your fingerprint, the closer the curve, the curve will be to step function. But what's the problem? If you want to make it a little more vertical, you have to add a lot of hash functions. So I had like 20,000, and it was nowhere near the step function, and the calculations were so long, I, even, I totally dropped the idea of trying it even. And now, since we have the uh, basics of tweaking, like I said, we have these three values. So number of hashes, the more, basically, the closer we are to the step function and the b and the n, and by manipulating the b and n values, we can choose with what jacquard index our items will be put into the same basket. But that's not all. What else we can do? We can do a lot of pre-processing. And that's a lot, big part, I think, in data science. What can we do? We can make our all strings lowercase. It will help a lot and it's simple, because then we don't have to care, for example, about accidental capitalists, and we can take numbers towards, but I marked a question mark there. Why? Because it also depends on your domain. For example, if we have two questions, what is square root of nine, and the questions, what is square root of three, it depends. If we want to catch them both as duplicate, the best tactic would be to just drop the numbers and don't even consider them. But on the other hand, in, if you would like to conclude them as unique, the better tactic would be to switch from the numbers just to translate it to words. It can be done by, it can be done by hash map, by any kind of map and then leave only alphabetic, like, for example, some users may put three question marks, some may put one, and if we strip all of the quotations and so on, and all of the exclamation marks, we are left with only the text, but not only with the meaning, because we also have some words which do not carry any meaning. These words are named like stop words, and basically, you can download just the TXT file with the list for every language. But what's the problem with stop words? They also depend on your business domain. So for example, I've, written, I've put here our three questions, which we were considering at the beginning, and then removed all the stop words. And what, what happened? We can see that between the duplicates, the Jacquard index is now uh, to fourth, like two fourths, so 50%. So it's lower, but between the unique questions, so the first row of Poland and last pharaoh of Egypt, it's, it dropped to zero. So after we removed all of the obsolete word, of, of, of the obsolete words, it, it is much, much more, uh, the, the core we are left in with is much more significant. 
But like I said, it totally de depends on your business domain because, for example, when we have two questions, who murdered Kennedy and when was Kennedy murdered, if we drop all of the step words, the core will be the same. But there are totally two different questions. The one is about the uh, who and the second is about a date. So, yeah, we have to talk with our Business, uh, domain owner or add some behavioral tests, uh, acceptance tests, and the best part, uh, the best thing I think, think to do when you are doing anything like this is to just, like I said, take the list, pass your algorithm through, and see what you have at the end. So, if for example, at the beginning, I had a lot of problem with math questions. I started working on improving the math questions. And just look at the accuracy percentage, the false positive percentage, and false negative percentage. Basically, how wrong we are. And don't be afraid to be wrong, because then you can improve yourself. And also, the pretty important thing with this algorithm is that it, will, it can and it will produce false positives and uh, accidental collisions. Like, for example, with MD5, no, yeah, MD5, maybe it's not so good example, but with MD5, uh, or a really good hashing algorithm, it's not possible, it's really rare to have accidental collision. So, the ha it's really rare that hashes of two given strings will produce the same number value. And with using the min hash, it can happen and it will, and we have to have some kind of fuse to check it. So after we detect all of our collisions, for example, for uh, the database I was uh, checking, it was like 190 collisions for the simple question like who was Abraham Lincoln, and uh, then we can look up the whole database, the whole 190, just by the dump compare, one by the one, and find duplicates amongst them in the naive comparing each to the other way. Why is this good? Because we drop the complexity for f from few thousand or few hundred thousand just to 100. It's much faster. And now to answer the question from the, my topic of the presentation, how to answer the question before it was even posted. We can calculate, well, first you have to have already big database of answers and questions, like we or Stack Overflow. And then when user is putting your question there, it can be question, it can be, I don't know, some kind of um, advertise. And uh, we can calculate the mean hash and compare it with all the mean hashes we have already in our database. And since, for example, the storage I used to play with the idea was MySQL, it, has, it had 50 columns because I had 50 groups of four, and I put the hash index there, and with 2.7 million of records, the search, um, the search was as long as 20 milliseconds. So I think for this number of records, it was pretty instant. And then we, if we already find the given, answer, given question in our database, we can already pro direct our user, hey, someone already asked this. Let's look at here. Maybe someone already answered. And, uh, but w you may ask, why is it better than any kind of regular search? Well, first, the regular search usually relies on keywords, and it may be not so important. And also, the regular search, yeah, it works for this purpose, but only with short questions. If we have really long, like textbook ones, or for example, stack trace, could be a good idea. Uh, it would be, I think, much better to use this algorithm than at any kind of search for looking at this kind of questions. And the last thing we can do to tweak it, instead of using words, as I said at the beginning, we can use engrams. Basically, what are engrams? 
these are groups of so another group groups of mm, n given semantic parts it can be words it can be letters syllabs etc etc here in our case i use letter ones because we have rather short documents a few thousand char characters at, at the best and we have this sliding window and produce well the best way to to talk about it is to see it so we have this sliding window and it slides dog eats to do then og g space and so and so on it also helps us finding questions with uh, typos for example because if we have any kind of typo then only and uh, construct n grams of two then only two n grams will be different and the rest will be still the same for the same questions so i guess that would be all and if you have any questions i would gladly answer them we have some box or questions some special microphone I'm waving to organizers do we have a microphone it's yeah, uh, where it is yeah okay so who has the questions okay so well catch it yeah I'm serious <laughs> sorry uh, yeah. my question is what was the final complexity of this algorithm uh, and also I would ask what was the space uh, complexity of this algorithm how much how much uh, how much space does it take uh, about space I can check it about after the presentation you can approach me I can check on my disk uh, the final complexity was truthfully on in finding the duplicates among gi given list mm, because at the end we have this hash table in the it was typical of n complexity worst case scenario still would be n squared because if we w would be given the list of the same questions it would be all passed to the same bucket and then we would still iterate on every single one but the typical was o n so it was a success okay so thank you you're welcome can you throw it further yeah but where where was the question? Oh, here, for example. I. Hey. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm just first to test this idea, and I'm don't, not sure if it's good. <laughs> but. Hi there. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask if, uh, for the different hashing algorithms, uh, we can use salt as well. Okay. Yeah. That's also a good idea. I didn't thought of that, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, can I? So, do we have any other? Yeah, we have 15 minutes, so I'll go from the bottom. So. Um, okay, this works. Uh, so, uh, did you evaluate other approaches? Like, and this all seems to me uh, mostly like uh, full text search. Uh, so did you, I know, did you look at, for example, PostgreSQL with its full text search? Because uh, just following this talk, it looks like, well, you just reinvented TS vectors. <laughs> so it is possible. And I also, if someone usually asks the question, did you thought of mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. The answer is usually no, I don't. And it's also in this case, uh, I don't. And it's possible. I honestly didn't know about it. It was just like, my coworker said, hey, you have LSH. And I started reading and so on and so on. Mm, the advantage, I would say, it's not storage dependent. So we can implement it basically anywhere. Uh, like I said, I used MySQL, but I'm f almost sure that it's a bad idea and we could use something faster and more, more better to this task. But yeah, I'll look into it. And maybe it's possible that it, it will work better. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, where was the question? Yeah. yeah thanks. Uh, okay. 
so my question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, you used a single uh, hashing algorithm family when creating multiple hashing algorithm versions for your collisions. Uh, did you consider or maybe measure how would the probability for each family affect the overall outcome of the algorithm you used? Uh, no, I don't, but recently we were checking the distribution of multiple hashing algorithms and it was sufficient enough, like uh, it was like 5% off with the million, with the million elements. And uh, I didn't have any accidental, well, I had accidental collisions, but it wasn't enough to worry. It was so small amount. Uh, in practical implementations, in practical implementation, I used more and more hash. So it's basically made to that thing, I would say. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think it's the last one. <laughs> okay, here we are. Oh. Thanks, so I guess I'm the only one getting up. <laughs> okay, um, uh, so you were trying to find uh, like collisions in meanings also. Um, did you uh, consider at all the punctuation because that can also greatly change the meaning of the sentence? Mm, no, I don't. I didn't. Mm, I think that the best part to... I don't know who's doing this. Uh, the best way to find a uh, final conclusion would I'm not moving. <laughs> Is it me or I'll just go back there? Okay, so I didn't, but like I said, after we are checking again for the collisions, the best way to do it and to find definitely all with the same meaning, after, because we remove the punctuation, then we have two questions when the punctuation is not so, it's important and they are unique. Then we would have to use some kind of, uh, well, canon, like neural networks and comparing of these uh, sentences and so on and dot products. And yeah, it's, it's a really complex task. And on Kaggle, even Quora had a few months back, like challenge you have the pair, just pair, not the list, just pair. And you have to guess, are they a duplicate? And um, yeah, this algorithm really wasn't uh, usable. It couldn't uh, compete in any way with the, with the solutions. But you have uh, ways to evaluate it. But like I said, then you have to shoot the, from the cannon to the fly. And uh, like it's, it was sufficient enough. Uh, and there's also the... Uh, there's also considering the speed versus the um, overall performance and accuracy. And like I said, the speed is really good. The accuracy, it's sometimes off. Well, honestly, I had like acceptance level of 5% of false positives and false negatives, which is pretty high. But in general, it, it just worked. So for our business requirements, it worked. If you want to just be 100% sure, well, it's not a final idea, but I would say it's a good start to just filter out and then you have much, much smaller start to work on. Okay. So in general, to conclude, I did not thought about punctuation to answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? So yeah, I'm a little bit earlier and Oh, the last one. Uh, so, uh, continue what you have said the last uh, time. Uh, what was how how big was your set for training? Because, as as you said, you you evaluated quite well. Because you said about the posi false positive and false negative uh, values. So, how big was your set, and how you achieved this set? Because uh, for for me, it's not really achievable in the easy way to have a good set which represents such a data it was uh, it was all the expert data or it was user generated data with the feedback of the, of the well, uh, well well finding and approval of, of the user 
Well, it was user generated by then. Yeah, uh, I, I asked how, how, how big was set and how it was generated. OK, so Great. basically it was taken from uh, our database. The ex domain experts just looked and said, hey, this tool looks the same. They should be marked as duplicate. And I had a list of mm, 1,000 pairs to work on. Mm, and they just gave it to me. Like I said, I need this to start even working on this thing. And when I had the list of 1,000 pairs, then I just pick one and pick a random from the rest of the list, and it was my unique pair. So given the list of 1,000 pairs of duplicates, it's really easy to create the much bigger list of than Unix. But after some conclusions, and when I was checking, for example, when I have too many false positives, I realized that it, they were correct. They shouldn't be marked as false positives, but business just was sometimes wrong. So also, it's, it's really easy to check. And I don't uh, know what's the exact thing you are looking for, but the Kaggle is really great to look for data sets. And also on some subreddit, I also saw that they have a lot of free open source data sets you can use to, to work on. So what was the main thing you are looking for? Is it also the questions and answers, or? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, ex ex par partially, partially it's uh, answer my questions. Actually, I, I was going to ask if, if, if you believe it's this algorithm that with that week so you made, is it not overfitting the data which you had? Uh, Maybe it's well, a specific question, and I will if after and <laughs> okay. ask you. Yeah, it's always good to evaluate your model, because it's data science model like any, like any kind of other. It's always to evaluate it uh, and then check. It's, uh, if it's used by people, then if it's anything wrong, uh, they will just come to you. But in general, it's good to have monitoring and check it. In this case, we totally relied on the input. And maybe it wasn't a good approach. Maybe we could do better and monitor the out outcome. But still, nobody has ever came to me and saying, hey, this doesn't work. So I just would assume it works. Thank you. OK. So if I think we have a room for the last one, if there is. I don't, I don't see it. OK. So thank you.